welcome to Amrita by the book. My name is Amrita and this is my booktube where today I'll be talking about six really fun classics for everyone to read. Now this came out of a number of conversations that I was having with various different people. More recently, I was on this podcast called Fuck Boys of Literature, which is an excellent and excellently funny podcast that everyone should be listening to. But basically, I was talking to Emily, Emily Edwards, who hosts the show, and we were discussing a variety of different things. And one of the things that came up as I was speaking to her was this idea that literature is only great if it addresses some kind of violence or anger or tragedy. I'm not sure exactly where it comes from, but it doesn't matter if you're talking about film or TV or books or even video games. There is some sort of cultural consensus across the globe that if something is happy, then it's not really all that great. And honestly, if you talk to performers, if you talk to creators, writers, they will always tell you that the most difficult thing in the world is to write comedy or to write something truly happy and joyous or fun. Anyway, it all got me thinking and I thought that I'd do a video about a few books that are considered classics but are not the tragic, realistic bore that a lot of books that are considered classics today actually ascribe to. Especially because I feel like a lot of people are put off the idea of reading the classics. And I don't mean children, I mean adults. I'll often hear people talk about how they are intimidated by a piece of literature. And literature should never be intimidating in my opinion. And I might be wrong, but I feel like that feeling of intimidation comes from the fact that a lot of these classics are sold as books that are going to explain the meaning of life, that have like very heavy themes and that are going to change your life. And what if you don't understand it? Or what if you don't like it? What does that say about you as a reader and as a person? And that's awful. Like nobody should feel that way about a piece of literature. And I say that as a reader, as somebody who enjoys reading and just enjoys books to my marrow. And so here are a few of my favorite classics that are a lot of fun. They don't always have a happy ending, so to speak, but it's fine. Like it is the journey that counts and the journey is always fun. First up is Scaramouche by Raphael Sabatini, which is a book that I read fairly recently thanks to my friend Becca, who loves it. And I kind of love it too. It's funny because so many of his works have been adapted by classic Hollywood and you know something is great, you know, it's like really swashbuckling and fun when classic Hollywood takes a hand at it. And obviously the movie versions are rather different from the book itself because each of these books has, you know, um, they're very much off their time and some of the themes that they discuss in these books are not exactly PG appropriate. So Scaramouche is the story of a young man who is bent upon revenge. He doesn't know who his parents are and he has been raised by a very respectable man who refuses to tell him the truth about his parentage. And then one day, a friend of his gets murdered in a duel and he swears revenge upon the man that murdered him. And then the rest of the story is about him going out of his way to ensure that the man who murdered his friend gets his just desserts. In many ways, this is one of the funniest things about this book because our lead character is kind of the lucky novice dialed up to a thousand in that he just shows up in these situations where he doesn't know anyone or anything. And then within the span of like a month or maybe six months at the most, he is suddenly the best that ever was at that particular thing. 
And in the meantime, he's having all these adventures, he's getting up to all these fights, he falls in love with women, falls out of love with women, he is constantly angling to get the murderer of his friend in trouble, he's meeting all these different characters, the French Revolution begins, and he actually utilizes the French Revolution in a way to get his revenge. I mean, this guy is really warped, and those are some of the best characters in literature. There is of course a twist to the tale but I knew what that twist was pretty much from the beginning and that is mainly because I grew up reading stories like this, you know, the swashbuckling revenge story. So I kind of knew where it was headed right from the beginning when we meet all the characters. But it doesn't matter, like even though I knew where we were headed, it didn't matter in the least to me. And if you're one of the people that doesn't pick up on all the foreshadowing, then that's fine too because when the twist does come, it is quite the shock to him if not to anyone else. And I'll be honest, like the ending is possibly the only part that I didn't really care for. But I understand why Sabatini might have chosen to end things that way. And I believe there's a sequel, but I don't know if the ending is addressed in the sequel. I hear it's not very good, so I'm not gonna read it. But Scaramouche, it's more than just a fun song. Next up is Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne and honestly I could have chosen pretty much anything by Jules Verne and it would have been fantastic. My other choice for this was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea which is my other favorite Jules Verne but honestly I don't think I've ever read a Jules Verne that wasn't fun. But I like this one despite its problems because it is just a really good adventure story. This is the story of a man who places a bet that says that he can travel around the world. And by around the world, he literally means, you know, just circumnavigate the globe in 80 days. And what follows is the story of him traveling from continent to continent using a variety of transportations, sometimes more genius and sometimes more prosaic, outwitting his enemies, getting in trouble with the law, engaging with a whole cast of characters. And of course, in India, he runs across this young woman who's about to be burnt alive in a pyre of her husband. This is a reference to the custom of sati, which was practiced up until, I think, the 19th century is when it was formally abolished. And the reason that it bothers me in this particular novel is because it plays into the stereotype of the white savior. And often when it comes particularly to women who are saved from the funeral part of their husbands, um, it becomes a weirdly sexualized tale. The woman in these situations is never like a 50-year-old mother of 10. It's always somebody who is really young and beautiful and described as being like lissom and slender and just a very exotic Indian beauty. And very frequently she's some kind of princess or, you know, and it just, it's something that you'll see over and over again in British literature and it's kind of gross. And by kind of, I mean it really is. But like I said, you know, like these are things that require you to really peek underneath the hood, so to speak, when you think about these stories. As the story is written, if you can focus on the lead character, then it is a really great adventure story. It's about him outwitting everyone that he meets and trying to meet his goal, and it's fun. Next up is King Solomon's Minds by H. Ryder Haggard and I have spoken about this recently in one of my other videos and it is one of my all-time favorite adventure stories. I mean, Alan Quatermain, what a great name for a character, you know? Like, you would absolutely trust your life to Alan Quatermain. But as I said before, again, he is a fairly problematic trope in stories of this kind because he is the great white hunter in Africa and he is, you know, one of those white men that go into the bush who know all about the tribes and can speak to them in pidgin or whatever. And 
You have to understand that this book has been written by a very staunch British imperialist and it doesn't hide that whatsoever. So the way Africa is portrayed, the way the tribes are portrayed as the sort of sentient savages and their nobility or lack of is sort of measured on this sliding scale of how close they are to the white people in the story. I mean, these are all things that are problematic. And you know my personal philosophy about reading things that are problematic. I feel like more people should read them just because it does nobody any good to hide their heads in the sand and pretend that it never happened. And it gives context to a lot of things that we read today. You know, like if you don't know these tropes and where they come from, then you might not recognize the forms that they have taken today. That is to all our detriment. Things that belong to a certain time belong to that time. We can read it, critique it, and ensure that it remains in that time. And in the meantime, you get to read a really great adventure story about discovering a lost world and, you know, making money. Next up is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. And honestly, this is possibly the best book of the lot in this video. The good thing about reading a book about a study of manners is that you don't have to worry about what it is bringing to your doorstep in terms of story. By which I mean you're basically reading about a set of characters that belong to the same social milieu and are interacting between themselves. And while you can take the time to discuss class in Britain at the time and things like that, this is also a very funny book and it's talking about a certain type of English life with humor and with a, there's no other way to put it, but a felicity of prose. This isn't my favorite Austen novel, but it is pretty close. And whenever I need a palate cleanser, this is the book that I'm most likely to pick up. Just because there are so many different things that are happening in this novel. Everyone thinks of it as a story of Darcy and Elizabeth, which it is, of course, but it has this really rich cast of supporting characters, each of them distinct and wonderful. This is the kind of book that you can pick up and read maybe a couple of scenes and then put it back down and then come back to it and read again. Although if you're reading it for the first time, I do recommend that you read it from start to finish. I read this a very long time ago for the first time and I have been a rereader ever since. So when I am talking about things like this, I'm really discussing it as a rereader. So you do need to keep that in mind. But yes, this book is delightful and I will recommend this to anybody. Next up is A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. And there are actually a couple of different ways that you can read this book. On the one hand, it is a really fun time travel story about a man who is transported back to early England back in the days of King Arthur and then must use his wits to survive in this foreign land and he uses his knowledge of life in 19th century America to survive and also to thrive it at King Arthur's court. Now I've spoken multiple times before about how I'm not really an Arthurian fan but this was one of the few books that I really enjoyed and that has to do with Twain's writing but also the way he imagines all these different predicaments that his lead character falls into. I mean there is so much plot in this particular book, it's a lot of fun. But for those with a more serious bent of mind, this also works if you read it from a post-colonialist American perspective because Twain is saying a lot of things about things like slavery and about educating the masses and about people's rebellions and you know like things that are very interesting if you look at America as an empire and its de facto imperialism out and about in the world. And it doesn't matter that it was written in the 19th century. I think a lot of the things that Twain is talking about and the things that he makes his lead character do, these are attitudes and 
processes of thought that I think continue to this day and as such it's really interesting. And my last recommendation for the day is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Okay, before I launch into my long, long love affair with this book, I do want to give a shout out to The Three Musketeers, which is this other book that Dumas wrote and is very good. And if you're interested in the French court and the French Revolution and all the rest of that, then that is pretty great. But for my money, The Count of Monte Cristo is the superior book, not just amongst Dumas' own works, but pretty much amongst all the other books, not just in this video, but anywhere. I love this book. I read the entire unabridged translated version when I was about 11, I think, and I fell so hard for it. Like I'd read an abridged version of it when I was about nine or 10 and I loved it. And then when I was 11, I read the whole thing and it was insanely good. This book has all the plot. Like literally think about something, it's there in this book. It is of course the story of an exquisite revenge that is planned and executed by a man who is wronged by the men whom he trusted and also the story of a doomed romance between him and his childhood sweetheart and it sort of weaves in and it creates all these different moral quandaries that he must solve and also it's the story of unimaginable wealth and French society and there's so many different threads that you could just follow. I mean literally you can pick up any single strand of story in this book and then do your research on that and you can be very happily occupied for months on end. But even if you're not of that bent, if you're not that kind of person and you just like to read a book and then leave it at that, then The Count of Monte Cristo is one of the most fun and delightful novels ever written. You are in it from the moment that you meet these characters. The young Edmund and his love affair with Mercedes, the life that they dream of for themselves and then you just follow his nightmare and then what happens to him in prison and then when he comes out and his heart breaks all over again. I mean, all of it. It is such inspired storytelling. So those are my recommendations for those of you who are intimidated by the classics or wish to expand your reading in the classics. And for those of you who've read these books, do you love them? Do you hate them? Sound off in the comments below so that people who would like to read these books can get a more rounded opinion. So especially if you hate them, maybe people would appreciate knowing why. For more videos, please hit the subscribe button.